later. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the purpose of the, the coffee chat uh, is to highlight um, the activities of um, units from the University of Michigan who are engaging with minority serving institutions. Uh, we also use this as a vehicle to highlight exemplars from across the campus who have um, a demonstrated commitment and evidence that supports um, their um, commitment and engagement with minority serving institutions. It also ser serves as a space where we can share uh, research uh, to expand our understanding and awareness of minority serving institutions, broadly speaking, um, of partnerships, of uh, research that uh, supports uh, our understanding of the students who attend these institutions and uh, that we say we want in our graduate and professional programs um, here at the University of Michigan and, and beyond. So it, it serves as a space for both scholars and practitioners to share uh, ideas, best practices, and other re uh, resources um, related to these, re um, these relationships and also to support uh, students as they transition from a minority serving institution into a graduate or professional program, uh, uh, particularly at an R1 uh, institution, but also uh, beyond as well. Again, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Uh, before we begin our conversation, just a, a couple of housekeeping uh, items. Uh, first, uh, I would like to ask for you all to uh, mute your mics um, when not speaking. Um, we'll have some time uh, throughout this discussion and at the end for um, questions and discussion. So please feel free to unmute yourself at that time to engage in um, at that moment. Um, if you prefer not to speak um, uh, verbally, then you can also use the chat function. I'll be uh, monitoring the chat function along with uh, my other Rackham colleagues. Uh, also, please feel free to, to use the raise hand function uh, as well um, to engage uh, in the discussion. Also, uh, please feel free to uh, enable the um, the uh, transcription uh, feature if if you see fit. Uh, that can be found uh, below with live transcript. I've enabled it on my end. I believe you all can see it, uh, but it should be an option available for you all as well. Uh, lastly, um, we want to emphasize that uh, this discussion and all the discussions. Um, uh, facilitated by the Rackham Graduate School, follow the IGR community guidelines. Um, so with that, we are uh, in support of uh, respectful or want to create a respectful respectful space uh, for our invited guests, um, for our participants to learn, grow, and share their um, vulnerabilities. Um, so please keep that in mind. Be mindful of the uh, intent and impact uh, of our words and uh, um, the impact that they may have on others when discussing our thoughts uh, in this particular space. Uh, as you all, uh, for those who are just now joining us, this meeting is recorded um, uh, so that folks who are unable to attend uh, can tap into this resource uh, uh, moving uh, in, into the future. With that, I would like to move into uh, introducing our uh, invited panelists uh, for today. Uh, we have Dr. Mike Holland Wynn, uh, who was an assistant professor at the University of Denver's uh, Mortgage College of Education. And he's also a faculty affiliate, affiliate at the Scribner Institute of Public Policy and the Interdisciplinary Research Institute for the Study of Inequality. Um, his research examines in, uh, the benefits and consequences of uh, public policy instruments in expanding or constraining the operations of colleges and universities with the specific focus on federal diversity initiatives. Um, in addition to his academic work, Dr. Wynn has extensive professional experience with federal policy as well, having served as a senator staff, a senior staff member uh, in the United States Congress. Uh, Dr. Wynn currently serves as a commissioner on the Denver Asian American Pacific Islander Commission a member of the board of directors for the Southeast Asia Resource Action Center and continues to volunteer and provide research consulting for education and civil rights organizations. Most recently, he was a lead author on an amicus brief on behalf of 678 social scientists uh, in SFFA versus Harvard, which was cited by the US Court of Appeals for the First Circuit in their opinion. 
Dr. Wynn completed his undergraduate studies uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, and his graduate education at the University of California, uh, Los Angeles. So if you all don't mind, let's give Dr. Wynn a, a huge round of applause and uh, thank him for uh, joining us in, uh, in this, this space here to, today. And with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Wynn. Well, th thanks so much, Edmund, and, and thanks for reading my bio. Sorry that I should have said something shorter. Uh, so, sorry about that, but thanks so much for um, uh, for the warm introduction and for for having me. I'm I'm really honored to to be here and to share um, uh, uh, more about anapesies and 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 how they sort of fit into the whole um, MS MSI uh, uh, ecosystem. So let me start by sharing my my PowerPoint here, and let's see. I I think, uh, so let me get this to go right. Okay, so I'm hoping now that you all see the, um, you all see the, the, main, uh, the main screen, right? You're not seeing the, the, the presenter view, but the, you're seeing the proper screen? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Uh, good to know. <laughs> I did a whole class lecture uh, about a month ago in, in the wrong view, and it was very embarrassing. So, so thanks. Um, so, so yeah. So today I'm I'm going to share uh, uh, more about this one particular MSI, um, Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander Serving Institutions, um, uh, known as as Anapesis, which is you know just a mouthful for for uh, for a designation, and so. Um, if you have trouble pronouncing it, I, I usually say, think of it like a person's name. Uh, the person's first name is Anna and their last name is Peasy. So Anna Peasy, uh, and uh, it makes it so easy as I, as I like to say. So um, before I formally begin though, I'd like to, I'd like to start with a, a land acknowledgement. Um, I'm here uh, at my institution at the University of Denver. And so it's really important for me to recognize that, that my institution, DU, um, resides on the traditional territories of the Arapaho, the Cheyenne, and the Ute. Um, and, and the Treaty of Fort Laramie, um, both of them, uh, as well as the secession of Fort, uh, 426, um, within the treaties of the Confederated Tribes of the Arapaho and the Cheyenne, removed these indigenous nations uh, from this land. And so it's with much gratitude that we recognize their descendant communities, the, the Northern Cheyenne tribe of Montana, the Northern Arapaho tribe of Wyoming, and the Southern Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma. Um, we also recognize uh, the Southern Ute tribe and Ute Mountain, tri Ute, Mountain Ute tribe, um, which are Colorado's uh, two federally recognized uh, tribal nations. Um, DU actually has a, a very um, tragic and horrific past in its founding. Um, and, and, and so, um, and so we, we want to recognize that as well as work towards um, a reconciliation. And so in that, uh, our, our, we, our university authored a report, the John, John Evans report, which I have a link here and I can, I can send out down the line, um, that details um, uh, our, 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 uh, the, our, our university's founders in, in um, their involvement in the Sand Creek Massacre. So, um, uh, it's important for us to share that and, and to acknowledge that. And then as well as um, uh, the land acknowledge, acknowledgement is a way for me to uh, sort of think about and frame the type of work that I do and, and, and very much so the, the, the presentation I'm, I'm about to give today. So with that, um, I, I would love to, to, to do a quick poll here, but I realized that I, I had to set that up beforehand on the PowerPoint. So maybe I, I will um, I will just sort of look to see, uh, I'll stop sharing and look to see hands real quick um, uh, um, uh, to see if, uh, have any of you heard of anapesis before or is this a relatively new thing? A couple thumbs up. All right, this is great. This is, I gotta say, this is probably one of the first times I've talked about anapesis and uh, and looks like about half the people in the room have, have heard about it before. So that's fantastic. Uh, let me start sharing again. And um, so that that is fantastic. Okay, so so um, I think you all know that that anapesis are, are one of actually 11 different federally uh, uh, federal MSI programs. Um, um, I know we often hear about HBCUs, uh, HSIs, tribal colleges, but uh, within sort of the federal purview of, of MSIs, 
Um, there's actually 11 different, uh, different designations, each with their own funding stream, um, each serving a specific target population, and really um, uh, uh, signals a federal commitment, to a certain extent, right, it signals a federal commitment to uh, students of color and, and their higher education needs. And so I hope um, so that this slide uh, shows you certainly that we're, we're going to talk about anapesis today, but some other ones that, that uh, tend to get, um, uh, you know, are, are not as discussed as much in the literature. Um, so just uh, just to share that that there are uh, typically more than more than uh, we're we're often aware of. Um, so so let me also begin then by sharing the um, uh, the anapesi origin story or how they uh, sort of came into existence. The anapesis are the newest MSI designation, uh, one of the newest, and um, and so uh, they were created actually in 2007. And so what uh, uh, Julie Park and Rob Taranishi argue was that the work to create this federal designation really came out of a desire to increase the capacity of Asian American and Pacific Islander organizations and institutions, um, as well as a frustration that AAPI needs in education were ignored or unknown. Um, and, and really this motivation was fueled by advocacy efforts uh, by community-based organizations and institutions um, in order to counter stereotypes about AAPIs and to ensure that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders were understood as a minority group um, and to attach uh, significant federal resources um, and funding to realize um, those beliefs. Um, and so um, that big, uh, that, that, uh, that big stereotype that um, feel the advocacy efforts um, to create anapesis really stem, uh, really is this model minority myth, right? I'm sure many of you have heard of it. It's this stereotype that um, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders achieve this uh, un universal and unparalleled academic, academic success, right? It, 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 the stereotype lumps um, all of us into this monolith, as Stacey Lee calls it, a monolithic monotone, um, thereby uh, uh, eliminating ethnic, cultural, social class, gender language, um, uh, uh, sexual generational achievement and other differences um, uh, that, that sort of do not represent the diversity of our community. And really uh, uh, five major misconceptions uh, about the model minority myth in higher education. And, and that one, it's AAPIs are not uh, really racial and ethnic minorities. They don't encounter major challenges because of their race. Um, they don't need any uh, resources or, or need any support um, and that their degree, uh, overall degree attainment numbers is equivalent to success. And of course, as, as we said earlier in the previous slide, that they're, also, they're viewed as all the same, right, as this monolithic monotone. Um, but what we really know instead is that uh, the, the community is, is really, really, really diverse. If you are to disaggregate the, the, the racial group um, uh, into... Um, two distinct racial categories, Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, there's, there's so many more ethnicities within that. These are just a handful, right? There's, um, there's in many cases, over 50 different ethnic groups um, represented here in the United States. And so um, there's no way that, that all these groups can, can really meet all of, all of these stereotypes, right? When it's so, so unbelievably diverse. And this is just talking about sort of, of ethnicity and rather than all the sort of intersectional identities that that, that um, AAPIs also uh, uh, also inhibit and, and identify with. And so what, what, you know, if we were to just look at one sort of variable and one metric, and I just noticed here that uh, when I copied the slide over, um, the, 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 the ethnicities are a little bit off, so I apologize for that. But if you just sort of look at educational attainment um, within, uh, just, just by ethnicity within AAPIs, and this is using um, census data, um, you can see that there's huge and major differences between uh, between groups and within specific subgroups. And so, um, and so really this, this approach to creating anapesis was born out of really a, a graphic like this, which, which was that um, uh, much of, of the knowledge and understanding of a, the educational experiences of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders is, is sort of hidden. Um, and when you uncover it, you realize that indeed AAPIs need, uh, need resources similar to other, uh, other communities of color. And that was sort of the, the big, push and motivating factor uh, for the creation of, of anapesis. If I can continue with this, this origin story, it actually dates back um, uh, 21 years ago um, to uh, in, in 2000, when the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, or KPAC, as we call it, um, hosted a forum to discuss AAPI and education issues. Um, this actually was followed up subsequently by, uh, by um, a summit 
hosted by uh, CRAC, the Southeast Asian uh, um, uh, uh, Southeast Asia Resource Action Center. I should get that right because I'm on their board of directors. Um, uh, they, they follow that up with a summit specifically on Southeast Asian issues in education in 2001. And so uh, because of the events put on by KPAC and CRAC, um, the newly created White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, or WIAPI, issued a report with recommendations for the creation of a federal designation um, for AAPI students, um, an AAPI serving institution, if you will. So following sort of that, um, that, that, uh, that uh, 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 trajectory, um, then Congressman uh, Underwood, Congress member Underwood, I, hopefully you can see my mouse here, I'm circling over him, um, uh, introduced the first legislation to create um, to create uh, uh, an AAPI survey institution uh, in 2002. Um, interestingly, though, he actually left uh, Congress, and he's from he represents Guam, by the way. He left Congress to run uh, run to be Guam's governor, and so the, the bill was later introduced um, in the next uh, session by uh, uh, Representative uh, Wu out of Oregon, and and using the same language, reintroduced the bill. And then at the same time, uh, uh, Senator Boxer of California and Senator Akaka of Hawaii introduced the Senate Companion Bill um, uh, it, it, with the House Bill. Um, and at that time, uh, 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 Congress Member Wu uh, struck an understanding with uh, Congress Member uh, Buck McKeon, who then was uh, chair of the House Education Committee um, to advance legislation. Um, uh, Congress Member McKeon uh, in that instance, asked the, the Government Accountability Office to draft a report um, to, to gather findings on the educational um, experiences of Asian American Pacific Islander students. Um, and so it was a year and a half later after uh, Congress Member Wu's request um, uh, uh, to advance this legislation from, from um, uh, Chairman McKeon that, that the GAO released that report. Um, and in that report, um, the, the, uh, the, the GAO, which is a federal agency, of course, an executive federal agency, uh, implicitly um, uh, noted that uh, they, they were not allowed to say that Congress should uh, establish and create an Asian American Pacific underserving institution. Um, uh, as a federal uh, uh, agency, they, they're unable to do that. But... Um, but instead, they did so implicitly by noting that one, there wasn't an AAPI serving uh, institution designation, um, and that, um, and they indicated that AAPI college students at, at that moment in time um, um, had to rely on other MSIs, HSIs, HBCUs, um, tribal colleges, et cetera, in order to be to be served. And so, after that report was um, was issued, there seemed to be some some really interesting momentum. Um, uh, 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 because Buck McKeon uh, seemed to be working well with, uh, with, uh, with um, Congressman Wu. Uh, however, if you sort of remember your congressional history at the time, this is now 2006, um, Democrats actually regained control of the House. Um, and so uh, Representative McKeon, who's actually a Republican, um, uh, now is no longer the chair of the Education Committee. And instead now the rank, then ranking member, now chair George Miller, who's a Democrat representing um, Northern California, the Bay Area specifically, uh, became the chair of the um, Education Committee. And actually uh, in, as chair of the committee and as a Democrat representing um, the Bay Area, specifically the East Bay, um, which is just uh, actually has a huge Southeast Asian population and just just north, just outside of UC Berkeley, um, took over as as chair. And he was actually quite unconvinced that um, an AAPI designation uh, was necessary. Um, he he actually argued uh, that um, uh, that uh, if if you were to create um, uh, an an AAPI serving institution, um, it would be it would be uh, serving uh, schools like Berkeley and Harvard um, was sort of his argument. And so it's actually rather curious and rather interesting that, um, or, or maybe to a certain, maybe I, I should be actually sort of unsurprised um, that, that, uh, that um, even me Democratic members of Congress who represent large Southeast Asian populations um, still have a sort of a misunderstanding and, and, and lack the context for um, for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, uh, but nonetheless, uh, thanks to the the huge efforts of CRAC, other AAPI 
uh, organizations in Washington, D.C. Of course, uh, members of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, they were able to uh, uh, um, share uh, research and information uh, to Chairman Miller, um, who then, um, who then uh, uh, realized, okay, yeah, this actually makes sense and that, um, and that uh, anapeses are necessary. And indeed they weren't there to serve schools like Berkeley or, or, or Harvard, but instead to serve institutions um, where a AAPIs tend to enroll in, which is actually uh, community colleges and regional comprehensive universities. And so with that, they, they, the, the legislation that had been introduced um, since 2002 was actually slid into a larger uh, uh, higher education bill the College Cost Reduction Act, uh, um, uh, College Cost Reduction and Access Act of 2007. And so that bill uh, moved through the House and the Senate and it was subsequently signed uh, by then President George W. Bush in 2007. Um, so uh, again, if, you, if you're, if you're a, a, a federal political junkie like me, you'll know that uh, once a designation is created and passed and, and, and put into law as statute, um, it still requires uh, a annual federal appropriations to be funded, um, and so that uh, and so um, it was authorized uh, via via the the uh, College Cost Reduction Act and a uh, Reduction Access Act, but it would needed to be funded, and so um, and so after that bill passed, uh, Congressman Honda, who actually uh, is uh, is my former boss, and I was on his staff for for seven years. Um, uh, passed uh, a, a helped pass an, an appropriations bill that included uh, the initial funding uh, for for anapeses. Um, and so that was how that's that was how it was created. It was um, I must admit a lot of lessons were learned. Um, a lot of lessons were actually learned from the the whole endeavor and experience in creating uh, Hispanic serving institutions, which were created about a decade before. Um, and so if, if you look, sort of look at it, um, it timeline wise, when the first bill was introduced in 2002 until um, the law was signed in 2007, a five year period to create a, a huge initiative um, like Anapesis is, is, is pretty spectacular. Um, and so, so much credit is actually given to the Latinx community um, for helping and consulting with um, uh, AAPI legislators and community advocates to help push uh, and 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 take the lessons learned from from their ten year endeavor to create HSIs. So so as I said, um, anapeses were created um, in 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 two thousand seven. We of course as researchers think of it very much as a federal racial project, um, but it's unlike other other. It's unlike um, HBCUs and tribal colleges, right? Um, and sim more similar to Hispanic survey institutions. Uh, predominantly black institutions in that uh, anapeses are actually a competitive grant that provides uh, funding for institutions uh, and really with two two main goals um, it's to increase this is part of the federal government is to increase uh, access of aapis as well as increase persistence uh, through retention programs now because that um, because anapeses are are a competitive grant that means that not in all institutions are, are going to qualify and so with that so um, really this rests on two primary federal criteria. One is that the institution needs to have um, an, a 10% undergraduate uh, student enrollment um, that uh, where the undergraduates identify as Asian American Pacific Islander, they use IPEDS for that. And then the second is if the institution meets the Higher Education Act's Section 312B basic uh, eligibility criteria, for Title III and Title V programs. Uh, that's a mouthful. What does that really mean? Sometimes in the literature, you see that it means that um, the institution needs to have 50% Pell, uh, Pell students. That's actually not 100% accurate. Um, and so uh, Section 312B is actually uh, has a lot more elements to it. One um, is that actually in addition to um, uh, the, the Pell eligibility, I'm sorry, Pell enrollment, which the, the 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 statute actually argues as as requisite enrollment of needy students, and so in other words, um, the fifty percent uh, Pell is one of the uh, many metrics an institution can use to demonstrate um, uh, can demonstrate that they have needy students. Uh, other other types of forms of financial aid also qualify. It's an unbelievably complicated formula, um, and of course, there's an, an, a second finance formula that requires the institution to have um, lower than average educational and general expenditures. Um, and so what you see here is that uh, th this is an important uh, important aspect because what it does is it um, it's there intentionally in order for uh, uh, 
community colleges and regional comprehensive universities to be um, to be prioritized above, say, um, an R1 institution that that will have a medical school, which then would uh, certainly bring up their expenditures. And so um, and so that that's a really important met uh, uh, distinction to, to point out within the the eligibility. And then, of course, specific to anapetes are sort of geographic um, requirements. So uh, so it purposely purpose, purposefully identifies uh, 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 regions of the United States and in, in, in the in, in the Pacific, um, where where institutions uh, where NAP eligible institutions could could be. In addition, um, it's not if you actually dig a little deeper into Section One Hundred and One of the Higher Education Act, that's where it also defines that for profit institutions are not eligible to become um, an ANAPC. And by the way, these are really similar requirements for HSIs and all of the other, what we like to call enrollment-based minority serving institutions. So given all of these requirements um, and el eligibility requirements, um, what we've seen over time is that uh, 217 colleges and universities across the United States um, have been historically have historically met these eligibility requirements, but given, as you know, shift in enrollment patterns, shift in institutional expenditure, how sometimes institutions strive to move up in their Carnegie classification, they may slip in out of these um, eligible uh, statuses. And, and, and so, as of right now, currently uh, in 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 2021, um, the U.S. Department of Education recognizes that there's about 162. Uh, currently eligible institutions. So you see there's actually some really, really big fl uh, fluctuations um, over time. Um, and then of course, uh, of all of these institutions, uh, since 2007, um, 38 colleges and universities have been funded um, as anapesies. So not a whole lot, right? Not a whole lot given sort of the, the, the number of institutions that are currently eligible as well as historically um, been eligible. Um, and then, and then, if you sort of uh, uh, put it in sort of context within uh, post-secondary education in the United States, um, anapaces really represent about five percent of all colleges and universities in the United States. Um, but if you look at sort of this other 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 pie, um, they enroll nearly forty percent of um, all uh, AAPI undergraduate students. Um, and so, yes, there's not a lot of them, but uh, but they certainly. Um, they certainly uh, enroll um, uh, the lion's share of API, you know, 40%. So um, very, very concentrated um, API students at, at these institutions. Um, certainly over time, we also see that the, the enrollment has gone up, right? If you compare um, community colleges in 2013 um, to 2018, that there's a significant rise. Same thing in 2013 to, to 2018, um, a, a, a less of an increase but um, but but certainly more. I look forward to actually recrunching this data uh, when when more updated iPads numbers come out for for 2021. Sort of in the same vein, um, uh, with respect to degree attainment for AAPIs, um, same thing, right? We see a, a huge rise in increase over time um, for associates as well as bachelor's degrees uh, of undergraduates um, uh, at anapesies across the United States. So in, in, in other words, I guess all, all those slides uh, really represent is that um, anapesies as, as little as, as they are in, uh, in the United States, they certainly um, um, are doing the lion's share and educating the, major, uh, uh, not, uh, the plurality of AAPI students um, in the United States. And so, um, uh, shoulder, you know, enrolling quite a bit and graduating quite a bit. And so, as I mentioned earlier, right, um, there, there's those three types of, uh, I'm sorry, two types of, of anapesies. One is that they are eligible uh, uh, to be funded. And then, uh, and then, of course, the 38 that have actually received funding uh, since 2007. And so, what we see is that when, when these 38 institutions receive, um, federal anapesi funding, they typically establish uh, anapesi programs on campus, a specific, oftentimes single unit on campus um, to serve AAPI students. Taranishi argues that um, you can sort of divvy them up into um, the responsibility to, in, into three primary categories, right? Academic and student, uh, student support services, leadership and mentorship opportunities, and research and, and resource development. And so um, with respect to academic and student support services, um, what we really see uh, on the ground mean uh, is that that um, they are creating uh, critically and culturally relevant res uh, responsive curriculum, um, academic counseling, career development, uh, leadership development, um, learning communities, peer mentorship, peer tutoring, 
Um, all of this is sort of operationalized often um, in, in, in new or, or um, classes that are, that are like Asian American studies, ethnic studies classes, where they're weaving in culturally relevant curriculum into, into not just classes in the humanities and social sciences, but also um, in STEM, in STEM fields. And of course, um, there are a host of benefits to this type of approach, right? The literature tells us um, uh, uh, that, that we see all sorts of academic and social cycle, social psych, uh, psychosocial, apologize, uh, psychosocial benefits that come from uh, this type of uh, pedagogical approach. And, and certainly um, uh, with respect to this context of anapeses, um, there's, there's emerging uh, new empirical research um, that demonstrates um, all of these uh, all of these sort of um, uh, academic outcomes uh, from from the work of anapeses, um, and I can share all of that literature uh, if if you'd like. Um, we also see that that anapese programs are are offering leadership and mentorship opportunities. Um, this includes a huge and wide range of co curricular and, uh, and leadership development, both on and off campus. Um, and so again, these are framed with a critical lens that recognizes API student experiences. And of course, um, as always, uh, culturally relevant and, and, and focused. Again, it borrows from, from ethnic studies, um, the ethnic studies model of connecting the academy uh, to the community. And certainly anapeses are, are natural bridges. They can be natural bridges that connect API communities with API students on campus. And so we've seen that these leadership opportunities uh, really uh, are designed with the intention to enhance uh, student civ civic engagement in their communities. Um, and then of course, lastly, research and resource development. Um, the, the, the federal funding that comes in is, is, is oftentimes used to, to fuel new academic research to expand um, new understandings of the API experience. Um, uh, we've seen some schools use this to disaggregate data on their campuses to show the diversity and complexity of API students. And we've also seen other institutions actually give out micro grants to their undergrads um, to engage in research, uh, not necessarily education research, but uh, any types of research um, or uh, on API, uh, on the API experience. Um, so it's it, 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 these three sort of together um, uh, uh, really represent some of the, all the sort of different initiatives that we're seeing at, at some of these 38 different, different anapeses. Now, um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting close to, towards the end of, of my PowerPoint here, but I, I, I certainly want to, to show this chart. Um, as I mentioned, a, anapeses are the newest, um, newest MSI, uh, one of the newest MSIs to be created in 2007. Actually, predominantly black institutions were created at, the, uh, at around um, I think at the same time in, in the same legislation. Uh, but if you sort of look at, at, at funding levels, and this is um, last year's funding levels, 2020, um, you'll see that there are some, um, the, the anapeses are, 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 um, are, are not funded at, at very good levels. And certainly, you know, I, I, it's hard to not compare them to other MSIs, but I certainly don't want to just do that alone, right? But, but certainly recognize that, um, that given sort of the, the large number of institutions that are eligible, and at, at this, when I made this chart, there was 160 rather than 162. Um, uh, but given sort of the, the annual appropriations of, of a little over 9 million a year, um, it sort of boils down to, if you were to divvy it up evenly amongst all 160, 162 institutions, it boils down to about 57,000 per institution, which is not a whole lot, uh, unfortunately. Now, I'm certainly not arguing um, that funding should be pulled from any of these other MSI designations for anapeses. Uh, that, that's the last thing I want to do. And instead, I, I would argue that um, the, the, the pie should be increased for all of these 11 different MSI designations. And in doing so, um, uh, would also increase funding for, for anapeses. And, and, and so looking to the future, actually, that's, let me, if, hopefully you can see my mouse. Uh, it, let me jump to this bullet point first about, about overall MSI funding. And so what we're actually seeing in, 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 in the Biden-Harris administration's uh, American uh, Families Plan, right, their, their, their new domestic policy that they just introduced, um, uh, I think, last month, um, it actually shows uh, 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 increasing um, uh, funding for all MSI, all 11 MSI initiatives by, by, by five times. So, um, so that's really, uh, really wonderful to see. So, 
um, it, it wouldn't be just NFPs. He's getting a five-time increase. It would be all of the other MSI designations also receiving a, 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 a times five increase, which I think would be fantastic. And so, so with that, uh, looking sort of to the future of anapesis, um, we know that um, we expect more anapesis to be on the horizon. Um, in fact, right now there is a, a new grant competition that's that, um, uh, and so schools are actually in the process of applying to receive uh, anapesi funding. What's rather interesting is that uh, the Department of Education has added a preference priority category, um, so that schools that have never received funding before. Um, um, uh, receive extra points in their application. So this, I guess that is intentional from the Department of Ed um, to make sure that institutions uh, that are not those 38 uh, have, a, have a good shot of, of getting funding this cycle. Certainly, um, I'm sure uh, um, if, if, you, if you had someone come and talk about HSIs, that this dual designation um, uh, situation is, is a rather interesting one. Um, what this means is that uh, institutions um, can sort of, at, it can only be one uh, MSI at one given time. Um, when we, uh, when we um, know that if you look at a lot of uh, anapeses, they're actually also all eligible for the most part to become uh, Hispanic serving institutions. Yet um, federal statute doesn't allow for a school to receive um, funding for, for both at the same time. Now that's actually not 100% accurate. Uh, the caveat is, um, is, let me see if I can go back a slide. Uh, hopefully you can see my mouse, is that uh, all of these MSIs are, uh, are funded actually into two different accounts. There's a Part A account and a Part F account. And so what that means is that a school cannot receive a Anapesi Part A grant as well as an HSI Part A grant at the same time. However, a school can receive an HSI Part A as well as an Anapesi Part F. So it's unbelievably complicated and, uh, and it sort of doesn't, there's no rhyme or reason why, um, uh, but instead uh, the dual designation would allow schools to be able to apply for either part A or part F. Um, uh, and, and it doesn't matter and if they, if they meet more eligibility standards for, for all MSIs can just apply for, for any of them, which I think you know, sort of makes more sense, right? Given that um, that a lot of these institutions are predominantly white institutions that over time, uh, given shifts in enrollment and demographics, um, become eligible for all these different MSI uh, um, uh, designations. And so, um, and so uh, schools can be very compositionally diverse and in doing so should be able to uh, be eligible for more than uh, one, one designation, uh, for, uh, especially from the viewpoint of administrators. And so um, that is something that had some momentum um, maybe about five years ago, and then it sort of went away. So um, I know that those conversations are beginning to, to, to be brought up again. Um, as I mentioned, uh, as, I, as I actually I didn't mention, but um, what we're actually also seeing is that there's an increasingly uh, large number of, of, of R1 institutions as well as private institutions that are striving and becoming anapesies and minority serving institutions. It's a rather interesting phenomena. I point that out, not that it's, uh, it, 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 it is necessarily a bad thing, um, but that uh, remember from, from when I shared the, the anapesie origin story that the original intent of the legislation was to make sure that funding was provided to um, institutions that tended to be um, uh, less resourced, right? So community colleges and regional comprehensive universities. Now we see we see a lot more R1s thinking about, uh, and also private institutions thinking about applying for and finding ways to actually meet the eligibility requirements. Um, and so I, I look, and, and certainly there are lots of students of color at these institutions. And so I'm not necessarily arguing that that's a, a bad thing, but uh, certainly, um, uh, uh, with respect to equity and for community colleges and for regional comprehensives, um, that is certainly something uh, important to talk about and, and, and to think about sort of the future of, of anapesies as, as, well as, um, as well as MSIs. Um, as I mentioned earlier, with respect to funding, we're seeing, you know, uh, the, the, the Biden and Harris administration is, 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 is all in when it comes to increasing funding for, um, for MSIs. And then of course, be, uh, given this pandemic, um, we've actually seen, and this is, I think, fantastic that in, in, the, in, the, in the last three stimulus bills, um, uh, the CARES Act, the CRRSA, as well as the uh, American Rescue Plan, um, all had specific MSI 
uh, provisions within the legislation to, to make sure that MSIs, um, uh, including anapesis, received uh, uh, additional support and funding, which, I, which is fantastic. And then um, lastly, uh, given that anapesis are, are the new kid on the block and, um, and a little over a decade old now, um, there continues to be a, a need for much more research. And luckily there is, um, there is a growing and emerging uh, 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 body of literature um, and, and young and new scholars that are, are working to um, contribute to, to this area. And so really um, uh, given their significant role and, and oftentimes innovative practices in educating a large proportion of AAPI students, um, I, I, I really think that anapesis are a backbone um, for API students in the US post-secondary education system. Um, of course, as more and more colleges, as we've seen in, in, in the trajectory, uh, become uh, anapesis or are eligible to become anapesis, really incumbent upon policymakers, um, those of us in higher education, um, to think about and recommit our efforts to strengthening this program um, for the next generation of, of AAPI students. Um, certainly, there's much more to be learned uh, from uh, from anapedes and the work they're doing, and so um, and so doing so, I think will will greatly benefit not only the practice that's happening um, at those institutions at anapedes, but as well as at, at institutions that are not anapedes, um, but yet are still serving um, Asian American and Pacific Islander students. And so, with that, I, I would um, uh, would be happy to answer um, any and all of your questions. And also on this slide here is uh, the, the, the very many different types of MSIs, I'm sorry, very many different types of anapesis um, across the country. And as you can see, there are a lot of community colleges, schools in the Pacific, schools in the Midwest, West Coast, East Coast. Um, and then of course, uh, uh, different types, right? Um, uh, Pacific University in Oregon is a private institution. Uh, you've got R1s like Minnesota and Maryland. Um, as well as regional comprehensives like San Francisco State University and, uh, and um, UMass Boston and Queens College. So with that, I will stop sharing my PowerPoint and that way I can see uh, everyone. Uh, great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wynn for that uh, presentation. It's great If we can just give him a quick round of applause, whether virtually or audibly or however you see fit, that would be um, wonderful. Um, now we'll take a, a couple of mom moments here to, um, um, you know, engage in a little bit of discussion here. I invite you all to, uh, as you all, you know, to the extent you feel comfortable to, um, you know, turn on your cameras uh, to engage. Um, I just want to add uh, one quick uh, reflection that I that I have here, and um, and, and again extend my my thanks um, once again. So when I first uh, came into this role in, in 2017, I looked at all the DEI plans across campus, and many of them identify engaging with minority serving institutions as a way to strengthen pathways into graduate and professional education uh, for, um, and I'm using their language, underrepresented minorities, right? And almost always um, that MSI meant historically black college and, and, and university, which I'm a huge proponent of. I'm an alum of a historically black college and university. Um, but I think the value in this type of discussion is saying it is um, highlighting that there are um, many more uh, institutions out there that we could be engaging with uh, in culturally and intellectually responsive ways. Uh, and there are more uh, students out there that we can be creating pathways for but are uh, in many cases often overlooked because we go with the institution that uh, we are most familiar with. So that's part of the reason why I wanted you to come in to, you know, highlight highlight um, these institutions um, a, a little bit more. So again, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, with that, I'll open up the floor for um, for questions here. Uh, and I know it always takes a couple of seconds before we get the first question off the ground. So I'll, I'm okay with living in, oh, we don't uh, here. Uh, Sasha has her, uh, their hand raised, so. Where's Hi, um, thank you for that wonderful presentation, Dr. Wynn. Um, I've learned so much. And so I'm actually working with a team at Michigan looking at um, where our, fo our research focus is really mental health and young people. and. We've recently become very interested in, um, well, we've always been very interested in MSIs because we've had a few in our survey work, um, but it's been really hard to engage them. Um, so I actually, I learned so much because I, for one, I've been calling anapesis AA, 
NAPISIs. And so just having a shortened term has been really helpful. Um, so I was wondering, so it looks like there's about 160 eligible anapesies, but only 38 that are funded. So I know you talked a little bit about eligibility, but I was wondering what it, it, it exactly means to be eligible. So like I noticed you calculated all of the eligible institutions when discussing MSI funding. So is there some benefit for the schools themselves to be like anapesie eligible, but not anapesie funded? Uh, with respect to funding, um, uh, before, uh, first thing, Sasha, uh, thanks. To, uh, I should probably start by saying thanks so much for the great question and, and, and for sharing that. I'm, I'm glad uh, that, that the, yeah, uh, Anna Peasy is the, uh, that you can, easy to learn when you think of it as a person's name. Um, uh, so great, great question. And, and, and before the pandemic, um, I would say, uh, I guess there really isn't a benefit to, to being ineligible. Uh, anapesi from a monetary standpoint, right? Certainly uh, when institutions um, um, become eligible, uh, oftentimes you see schools put out a press release saying that, you know, they meet, you know, they're, they're, they're designated now, which is actually not true uh, per federal statute, but it's actually, I was talking to somebody else about this this morning. Uh, it's actually the Department of Education's fault because they misuse that language in their, in their, in their, on their websites, but in law, um, uh, they do not, uh, schools do not become designated. If you read, you know, if you look at the Higher Education Act. So that's a fun federal fact if, 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 if you care about any of that stuff. Um, so, so, so to a certain extent, I, I think it's great that schools uh, strive for that. And then they, they put out a press release. Hopefully to me, hopefully that means, you know, that they, uh, even if they're not receiving funding, that, um, that they are, are beginning to show some commitment to serving AAPI students on their campus uh, in, in whatever way that they can with whatever resources that they currently have. Now, in a, in a COVID world, though, as I mentioned, uh, you know, we've, uh, Congress has passed three law, three stimulus bills, um, right, CARES Act, CRRSAA, and then most recently the American Rescue Plan. Um, and, and in those three, those three pieces of legislation, those stimulus bills, um, there was, as I mentioned, there was specific carve out funding for um, all MSIs. And, um, and in that though, they, the, the funding was actually given to all eligible institutions and not just uh, funded or previously funded institutions. And so if you were eligible, then you received um, funding uh, uh, because of your eligibility status. So that's actually the first time ever. Uh, and this goes for HSIs, this goes for predominantly black institutions, this goes for Alaska native serving institutions, native Hawaiian serving institutions, all of those other, um, what I like to call en enrollment based MSIs. So this is actually the first time, at least from what I've seen, uh, uh, that the federal government has provided funding um, for eligible institutions. Um, uh, and so, yeah, so, so yes, there is now a benefit for it. And hopefully my hope is because they receive funding under those designations, um, uh, that then um, if schools didn't know that they were eligible, um, now we'll think about uh, potentially figuring out how to apply and or serving um, either their AAPI, Latinx, um, Native American and, and African-American students on their, on their campus. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I don't want to take up too much space. I just have a really quick follow up question to my question, which was, um, so you mentioned in terms of the funding, you mentioned that a lot of times these anapesies could also be categorized as Hispanic serving institutions. So based on this funding chart that you um, discussed, like, would it make more, would, would it be more appealing for schools to, to kind of apply for Hispanic serving institution funding because they would get more money? Uh, great, great question. Um, so like, for instance, you know, my home state, I mean, in my home state of California, um, every, just about every anapesi, uh, every eligible anapesi um, is also eligible uh, to be a Hispanic, a Hispanic serving institution. So, so there's a lot of overlap there, you know, in, in states like California and to a certain extent in Illinois and in New York. Um, and so, uh, th th you know, and so th there's a lot of overlap there. Um, if you look at that funding chart again, and I can share a report that we had with, uh, with the exact same numbers, um, and certainly um, um, institutions that are, that are eligible for HSIs, there's a lot more funding attached to that. Not only um, is there more funding, but there's actually two other HSI designations that are federal federally funded, right? HSI STEM and 
uh, post-baccalaureate opportunities for Hispanic Americans, right? So those other types of HSIs. And so, um, and so there's actually, uh, if you add it all up, there's actually a lot more money in HSIs. And so um, there's actually, you know, no empirical research to show, uh, not yet at least. I imagine um, uh, someone will eventually do that type of work to sort of see the tensions that play out between it, it, does it, how does an institution decide which of these designations it wants to go for? Um, and so I think we can avoid those tensions by essentially opening it up for, for all institutions, right? But I do know from sort of firsthand gossip knowledge that, uh, that, that certainly there have been institutions um, that, um, that have been awarded both, have been awarded a HSI Part A and an NPC Part A, and then have de decided to go uh, to, 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 with, to withdraw themselves from the Anapesi grant because the HSI grant was double, sometimes double the amount of funding, right? I sort of can't fault anybody necessarily for doing that. Um, I mean, I can't fault a college, admin, a college president for, for doing that because um, um, they certainly want as much money as they can get, especially if they're an under-resourced institution. Um, but I, and I also want to acknowledge that there's, there's Latinx students that, 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 that need services and support um, at, at these MSIs. And so maybe the, 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 the best solution is to make sure that all minoritized students on the college campus can, can, um, can, can receive uh, resources from the federal government. Um, should also note that those percentages are like are arbitrary, right? I mean, how did they come up with twenty five percent? How did they come up with ten percent for these? You know, the the, the you know this was, um, uh, you know, these are federal. As Gina Garcia says, these are federal constructs that policymakers made up, just sort of put given given, uh, and they came up with those those percentages just sort of based on US population numbers, right? At the time, API is made up of about 5% of the national population. So they said, oh yeah, 10% seems right, about right. Um, so, so that's sort of how, how um, and it sort of also falls in line with other types of MSIs. So for the non-tribal serving institute, non-tribal Native American serving institutions, that's also a 10% requirement. So, it, you know, they're sort of trying to make, uh, they, they're using other MSIs, um, uh, to sort of uh, keep uh, match up and, and, and keep things somewhat consistent. Um, if you want to say that Congress members have infinite wisdom, that's sort of the, that's sort of the, um, that's sort of the thinking there. Thank you so much. Thank you for the great question. Hi there, I have a question for you. Um, thanks so much, Professor Nguyen for that. Great presentation. I work with a lot of Asian American and Pacific Islander students at U of M. I coordinate one of um, our ethnic graduation celebrations and the, the Asian and Pacific Islander celebration. And it's one of the most recent and also, in my opinion, really complicated because we're trying to serve Asian students, Asian American, Pacific Islander. And so um, I kind of have two questions for you if we have time. But my kind of overarching question is how, um, with the creation of Anapesis, how did that bring in Asian American and Pacific Islander students into programs that are, hip, that are for underrepresented minorities, which do not include Asian American, which don't include AAPI students. So how do they kind of get folded in or are there new sorts of programs created for AAPI students? Um, and with that, is there, um, are there different services provided for Asian American students versus PI and Native Hawaiian students, or is it they're all kind of lumped together? What, what a great question. Thanks, thanks for, for, for sharing that. Um, you know, uh, the answer is sort of, to answer sort of your, your most previous question, sort of yes and no, right? Um, um, it, you, know, uh, you know, that other the slide that, and, and you mentioned this, and, and the other, that one of the slides I had shows really how diverse and complex um, AAPIs are, and, and that's just broken up by ethnicity, right? Uh, not even including all the other intersexual identities that, that, um, that, that AAPIs hold. And so uh, the, the sort of complication here is, is that it, it, it um, uh, so, as you mentioned, that sometimes AAPI students are not understood to be uh, 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 have minoritized identities, right? And so, a lot of institutions won't include them in their in their in their URM variable, right? If they if they use that term still, 
um, underrepresented minority variable. Um, and so, um, and so that, 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 that can be a, a huge problem, right? Um, and, and a lot of that sort of is, is again, focused on, on that stereotype that we can, you know, we, we're trying to shake all the time that model minority stereotype uh, that we're, we're trying to shake, but that um, it is so pervasive. It is so pervasive in that um, you had members of Congress who represent um, underserved Southeast Asian populations think that anapesis aren't necessary because all AAPIs go to Harvard and go to Berkeley, um, and, and yet those are their constituents. Um, and so it is pervasive, uh, it, you know, and he's a progressive liberal guy. I don't want to hate on um, uh, uh, Chairman Miller, who's, by the way, on that slide, all of those members of Congress, um, as well as President Bush, obviously, all retired now. None of them are serving anymore uh, in, in the House. So just a fun, fun point. Um, but um, uh, but but so it, 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 that that stereotype, that understanding or lack of understanding of APIs is, is so pervasive. I think that that makes it really really comp uh, makes it harder uh, for folks to understand potentially, as well as for us to think about how do we provide uh, programs and services. And so to to answer one of your other questions, and certainly because of the diversity and complexity, it also means that um, students are going to have different needs. They're going to have different life experiences. Right? You've got um, you've got East Asians who have a very unique history of immigrating to the United States. You have Southeast Asians who came as refugees. You have um, um, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders who were always here and are 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 um, and their lands were colonized through settler colonialism, right? So all of those experiences are so different, uh, and so uh, having to be able to, I think, what makes the NPC so great is that um, if use if those funds are used intentionally, they can provide specific programming and funding for all of these unique populations. Um, um, but of course, why are we, if it we're so different, why are we all lumped together? Um, some of that has to do with, um, with the way we're all racialized to, to, to sort of be the same, right? But also, if, you know, um, uh, uh, in, you know, in the words of, of Yenle, Dr. Yenle Spertu, uh, it, it, the, the, us coming together is a pan-ethnic movement to create political power. And without that, 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 um, the fact that we're racialized and thus sometimes treated similarly, um, as we as we coalesce together through pan-ethnic movements, then we can create political power to, as I sort of talked talked about at the beginning, um, push and advance legislation to create these these initiatives. So that duality is playing out all the time, right? Is that we are coming together because we have some shared experiences, but then we're also simultaneously very diverse, very complex, very different, have different needs, and I think. The message I always like to give is that it's not one or the other. It's always both for API communities. It's always both at the same time, um, and that needs to be. Uh, that's that's sort of the message that I'm constantly trying to push and, and advocate for. So that was really long winded. Hopefully, I answered your question in that process. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, unfortunately, we are at time, and I want to respect every everybody's time. Um, um, once again, uh, thank you all for joining us and kind of engaging in this space. Um, thank you, Dr. Wynn, for your uh, thoughtful presentation and thoughtful responses um, uh, provided um, here within. I hope to have you back again in the future, uh, to whatever extent you're willing to uh, uh, um, join us. Um, and then lastly, I want to invite everybody out to our um, next coffee chat, uh, which will be held June 23rd. Um, I'll drop the registration informa information. We'll have folks from Fisk University, Vanderbilt University to talk about their um, fixed um, uh, master's to PhD um, bridge program that they have there. But again, Dr. Wynn, uh, incredible. Uh, thank you uh, for your time, energy, and effort here today. Much appreciated. Edmund, thanks so much for having me and thank you all for attending. And maybe if I ever have the opportunity to, to talk to you all again, I'll explain why the word Native American is in there when, um, when, uh, when anapheses are not intended to serve indigenous populations. But that, that can be for a, a, another time. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thanks so much.